the river was the metaphor for life, which is a very ancient idea. The journey of life was simultaneous. The journey through the river as it moved past the mountains, bridges crossed it, connections were made, all of it was happening simultaneously. And I thought that fitted with my idea of a river. And, and essentially that metaphor has underwritten everything that I've done. And I can see the same process applying to David, you know, in that he's decided to formalize the river in a quite an oriental way and to include the spiritual interior aspects close to with the symbols and the metaphors of bridges and boats that represent stages of his life and the, the world at large nearby but, but at a barrier. I don't quite know why I do it. I do know I have to do it. The blank piece of paper and the kind of excitement of starting something new, not being quite sure what exactly it is I'm starting or where it might go. And uh, a few years ago, I bought a sketchbook. I loved the idea that you could open this book up. One evening, I picked it up. I started drawing, I don't know, some leaves, which became an apple tree. Behind the tree, I eventually drew a bit of a river, some rocks in, in the water and the spray. Over the next couple of evenings, I carried this drawing on, sort of thought, well, I could draw a river, because I can open the book up and it can start with the, the source, a little spring, and narrow, and it can widen out and eventually go off to meet the sea. At some point, quite early on, I thought that the river would be autobiographical. I thought that each page might represent one year of my life. It opens right up to be nearly 15 feet long. I loved the idea that you didn't turn a page over, you sort of opened the book out. I was fascinated by the, the format of the sketchbook. The river is from my birth to my 60th year. So I'm just working on the 60th of these panels. and will represent as far as this autobiographical drawing goes. Since I've begun two thirds of the way through the volume, where I began drawing, uh, represented the 40th year. I thought that there would be a bank in the foreground which would represent my interior life, my thinking, my imagination, and the far bank represents the, the, the outside world. And the river could have rapids where life was exciting and it, things were moving quite fast and I'd find ways of hanging flags in the trees or something to s mark the years when my children were born. Significant events in my life. Things like that fed into the thing and I developed this drawing. I didn't know that it would stretch out to be 30 foot long eventually and it would cover my life well, for the first 60 years. Some point in the making of it, I was wondering how you could show it to people. I thought it might be a film. Maybe a, ca a camera could travel through this drawing and it would be a kind of an autobiography. It would kind of be my life represented as a river. From there, I found some musicians who would compose a soundtrack to the drawing. There's a Northumbrian piper, composer Catherine Tuchel. I'm very fond of her music. And I thought that the Northumbrian pipes might be good to kind of have the chatter of moving water. So I, I explained to Catherine what it was I was hoping for. And uh, she very kindly agreed to have a go. I made a photocopy of the drawing glued sellotaped it all together and had a strip of paper along the bottom 
which where I've explained some of the symbolism, some of the things that are going on, and I put the years on so that she had an idea of the chronology and what was going on. And then I asked her to just respond to the drawing as she saw it. It's a pretty bonkers idea really, isn't it? A drawing that's 30 foot long. It doesn't really, uh, it's not terribly practical. And we thought it would be a good idea to have some other instruments as well. So we asked a fantastic guitarist, Martin Simpson, to play slide guitar and I think banjo on a few parts of the soundtrack. So I think there's fiddle, piano, guitar, banjo and um, the Northumbrian pipes. People often ask me, when did you become an artist? When you did, did you decide to do that? I don't think there was a moment when I made a choice. I think it was pre-chosen. That was, that, was that was the ticket I got when I was born. A river has a spring, it has a beginning. So this, the drawing here, was a, that's the moment of my birth. This is childhood, this is learning to walk. Everything is, is tall and big and interesting and new. I was born in Exeter in Devon, 64 years ago. My dad was in the army and so we, as a family we travelled around quite a lot. At these three birds kind of pecking above a hole, strange image of a figure on that post. For me, that's an early intimation that everything's not right with the world and it's not always sunshine and roses. So these three trees here, they're, they're nicked from Rembrandt. And I think that's Sunday school and beginning to be taught about religion and thinking about some of that stuff. And then we went to Scotland and I started school. I think two years later we moved to Malta. The dark clouds, the rain, as, as a young person, as a child, secondary school, I think I miscommunicated with my peers quite a bit. I was bullied at one time. You know, all of that stuff feeds into who I am. I went to secondary school in, in Essex, in Colchester. I was drawing all the time. I used to be quick enough academically to sit at the back of the class and draw the whole time and not get into trouble for not being able to answer the teacher's questions. So there's quite a few toys in the, in the drawing and they all sort of point backwards, they all I don't know, I only noticed that myself after I'd finished drawing most of it. My dad was an extraordinary man. I grew up in orphanages and when he was 15, he joined the army as a boy soldier and he couldn't read and write at that point. When I was 15, he quietly said to me one day that I don't, I don't know about the education. I don't know about these things. You'll have to decide for yourself. I think, with hindsight, was extraordinarily generous, really, and quite clever. But in the sequence of these drawings, that's kind of represented by this bonfire, because I think, at this point, I'm determined that I'm gonna, I'm gonna live my life, I'm gonna, but I'm gonna be responsible as much as I can be for the decisions. And I, and I left behind, probably, that feeling about not joining in with the crowd that I'm going to be different, I'm going to be me, I'm going to stand aside, I'm not going to join the club.
if I'm passing through the city of London, I'll quite often go and sit in Bunhill Fields where Blake was buried and just sit there and listen to the birds or something. There was a grave marker and on it it says, nearby lie the remains of the poet painter. And it's that nearby that's always intrigued me and fascinated me. So I was sitting, sitting there one morning and some feathers started to fall out of the sky. And tiny, there were two birds having a fight up in the sky. And these birds were Later that day, I started drawing a fledgling bird and some apple cores. And all of that, slowly over about a year, coalesced into four large pictures. Kind of a conversation with Blake and the ideas, Blake's radical vision for the world. This is a portrait of Blake. There'll be a portrait of me there. And we're sitting across a table, having a chat. What's clearly visible here is the connections of things that are very close to me. And I notice, first of all, straight away, the, the Bunhill Fields Memorial under the fig tree for William and Catherine Blake, who were buried nearby. They're not actually buried on that spot. And David has obviously made this point central to his own work. And even though they've discovered that Blake is actually in a public grave a short distance away towards the west where he's buried with a bunch of anonymous people who've been completely forgotten. What I like about Blake is that he was his own man. He saw the world, he felt about the world, he had compassion and feelings for other people. He, he had, a, he had an, an idea that human kind could organize themselves better for the benefit of all rather than for the benefit of a few. Blake was somebody who was quite happy to take a contrary view to the common view. These are all qu quite good ways of being I think and I don't know exactly what in these goldfinches singing in the tree, the feathers falling down, the sunlight all of that was as a trigger to make the drawings because the drawings are very much about my interest in Blake, but they were triggered by this, just this little moment. The idea of the bird, the bird as an augury, the kind of uh, Robert Gravesy sense of the significance of which birds come to talk to you seems to be a notation. It's almost musical, a kind of notation in these, in these drawings. And um, I've felt that quite myself. They're, they're very important, the bird as a kind of com companion and uh, commentator. In folk tradition, the, the, the bird is prophetic, the rich birds appear to you. you. It's almost a sort of psychodrama that you, by recognizing particular birds that are there, then you realize this is something, foretelling something in your own life. That these birds commentate and they're, they're outside time. They're like they're like ancestors as well as something else. They've been here longer and they, they have more of an engagement with place. I hope I've made a little body of work that speaks about Blake and his work and his philosophies, but is also interesting to look at and think about for a contemporary viewer now. And I think that's developed entirely out of the river drawing is beginning to make pictures that are more about me and my response to the art of the past. The way I draw is kind of laborious. That's not terribly interesting in itself. But the adjustment process, the changing the decisions, moving things slightly, bringing out a highlight, strengthening a shadow, all of that stuff kind of goes on all the time and you, you know you, you, you're busy drawing here and you think oh that's, that, maybe that line there just needs emphasizing a little you know you, you're sort of making decisions 
back the whole piece, even when you're focused on specific little moments. Secondary school had this extraordinary deputy head who listened when I said, I don't want to go to university. I just want to draw pictures. And he did a deal with me. He very cleverly persuaded me to take academic A-levels so that I could go to university to study fine art, which was a wonderful thing because it meant I didn't have to do sports. I taught myself to do A-level art. You know, when most people, most of my peers were doing three A-levels, I did four but I didn't have to do community service and I didn't have to play rugby or any of those things. So around this time I also met Jean and, and we've thrown in our lot together. Gone to Leeds to study fine art, so um, that's it. I'm determined that is the, that's the path that's mapped out now, which is what this, this area's about. So the bridge here is Jean and I coming together and we decide to get married. Jean gave me the possibility, I think, of communicating with the, the outside world much better than I ever managed on my own. Whilst I was in Leeds, we had visiting Master Etcher coming there, and I got on very well with him, a man called James Collier. So after Leeds University, I actually worked for a year in their studio in London, printing other artists' etchings. So worked with Robin Denny and Rory McHugh and Henry Moore a little bit. Yeah, I loved it. I, it was fantastic. And I got to meet a lot of people, see different ways of working. And because I was the studio junior, often my job was to sit with artists whilst they signed editions or parcel them up and deliver them. So quite often I'd have to take a taxi, but take a load of prints to Robin Denny studio or something like that. So I think I got some insights into the practice of art and what different people's studios looked like, how they worked. At that time I made a lot of etchings, it's the, the kind of graphic way of working run through, through my work all the time. And then I went to the Royal College of Art. When I worked at JC Editions, one of the artists we worked with a lot was Norman Stevens. Fantastic, really, really sweet, apparently very gruff New Yorkshireman. Norman one day said, um, oh, when you get to the Royal College, it's all sorted. Right. What are you talking about? What are you, what are you talking about? He said, oh, I've sorted it. Some of the tutors there aren't up to much, but I've sorted it. So when I got to the Royal College, I found that my tutor was David Tyndall. And that was Norman's gift, really. He put me in touch with Tyndall. David Tyndall introduced me to the Piccadilly Gallery in Cork Street, where I had had a show probably every three years for 12, 15 years. Yeah, Norman's gift. Hmm. It was fantastic. I think I was very fortunate. I was towards the end of art teaching that didn't impose a, a curriculum. So four years in Leeds, three years at the Royal College, pretty much seven years of my own research, do what you want. If you wanted to study traditionally and have you know a life model that that was available but if you wanted to make a film on the moors with infrared camera film that was available here we see the artist engaged in painting william blake's portrait blake doesn't seem to be speaking and in fact looks quite like an elderly contemporary poet where he looks like he might be hugh mcdermott or somebody but he's there and he's engaged in the way that he himself used to talk to angels and ghosts and worthies from the past. 
and the bird is staring at Blake. So I think it all connects up very pertinently. Whilst at the Royal College, I won some student lottery and went to study in Paris for three months as well, which just was a studio on the Seine. So Jean and I are married by that time. We've got a baby. It's, you know, it was, it was, a, it was a fun time. This is our little family ship. We're, we're off as a, as a unit probably a little bit hesitant. We've lost an oar already. We're, we're not quite sure whether we're being launched into the water, but it was quite difficult. We lived in a squat in East South East London. Uh, I took a bus across London, diagonally across London every day to get to the Royal College. It's great. It's good. Good for me. This is a period when Lots and lots going on in my life, lots of ideas, lots of possibilities, but there's a mixture of, of flowers and briars and we didn't have much money, you know, it, it's the usual young family, I've left college. I think there was a long time, especially with a young family, when I thought, is this possible? Could we survive if I selfishly just locked myself in a room and made pictures? It's a very therapeutic activity and it seems like the most satisfying way I've come up with for making images. I don't think I have a choice. I think I have to make images. And I love paper. I love handmade paper, smooth paper. I love sharp mark making, implements, pencils, pens, paintbrushes. And obviously I like the control of small, precise mark making. Uh, I end up with an image that if it's well made, if I've if I've done a good job, it's a very satisfying object. I think, yeah, I'm trying to make something beautiful, I'm trying to make something interesting and that says something about what a human being might be here for, to observe, to enjoy, to record, to leave behind a statement about what you found in the world, what you found beautiful in the world. I could, you could, I could use the same language, the same technique to make an image of something that I found ugly or unattractive in the world. Or I could make pictures of beautiful things with uglier, broader, more gestural marks and I can see the, the attractiveness of both of those ways of making pictures. But this is the one I've settled into over a lot of decades of scribbling on paper. This, this, is, the, this is the language and the technique that feels most comfortable. I've been drawing gardens for an awful long time. I, th I think for me a garden is a kind of symbol of human ambition and human capability and pride and everything about what we are and 
how we are, and yet the weeds keep growing. And left to its own devices, the garden returns to a kind of natural state. Human beings have an intrinsic need for a spirituality, an understanding of what it's all about, making sense of being in the world. And I think the garden is a, a great symbol for that. It's a great symbol for our trying to organise, make, create beauty, be engaged, be, be working, be doing things. And yet, ultimately, the garden will revert to wild plants. You know, you can never weed a garden enough in a, in a way. So I think the garden is one of those great symbols of human endeavour and imagination and creativity. I like to think I'm a spiritual person, but I think we all are. I think that's part of us. I think that's part of being human. So I'm not talking about attending church or public worship or accepting a particular belief system. I'm talking more about trying to understand what it is to, to live a life on this planet, the, where we are in, in the universe. And, and I suppose that's what the river drawing is too, that that river drawing, that kind of record of a life, that's what it is. It's a kind of drawn life, a, a drawing of a remembered life. probably three decades of drawing gardens, but I see recently and probably partly as a result of this river drawing, there's more birds appearing in the garden. It's not just plants. It's not just the architecture of trees and the planting. I don't know what that means, but it means something, I'm sure. This statue of an angel with no hands, that's, I think, another harbinger of things aren't quite right inside me. I'm not happy. I'm not... I mean, I'm not unhappy. And, you know, I may have felt that there were opportunities that were available and then they weren't available so there's things like the gates and these odd bits of ladders out of the river and that there. This is the late 80s. It was, it was hard time. Financially it was difficult. I think it inhibited my work for quite a few years really. In 1990 I'm, I'm probably seriously depressed. I didn't talk much to anybody. Matthew was born, that was a good thing. I surrounded myself with books, you know, that, that, that's probably all, it's just a miserable period, is probably all we need to know. Out of that, I started to become more involved with music and eventually set up a record label around this time. And I think I'm unsure about whether, whether I can continue to make pictures and stuff. So the the foreground bank had sort of disappeared there and it's a bit fenced off. And then there's a waterfall, which represents a significant change in my thinking. I, I devoted a lot of time to music and trying to have a more regular kind of income. If you publish somebody's record, you've sort of entered into an obligation to be professional, be available, do what you can to help that record be as successful as possible. It's, it wouldn't really be acceptable to say, well, hang on a minute, I'll deal with that tomorrow, I'm drawing today. So I think, yeah, it did get in the way. A couple of examples right there. The, uh, Shirley Collins, wonderful English folk singer, very, very dear friend of mine. 
I began reissuing a lot of her earlier recordings and she made it a condition of reissuing the records. I had to design new sleeves for them. She was very keen that included some of my artwork on the, on the covers. As far back as I can remember, I've always scribbled, I've always drawn. I can't really remember a time when I wasn't interested in music as well. You know, growing up, you know, right at the end of the 60s, early 70s, pop music, which led me on to folk and blues and jazz and other kinds of popular music. But I think when we lived in London and I was at the Royal College, the studio that I used at home was like the front bedroom in a little terraced house and there was a London Transport bus depot just up the street and I often would work through the night, not, not go to sleep at all. It was quite noisy and the Jean and Rebecca, our baby, slept at the back of the house so I could turn the hi-fi up so that I couldn't hear the buses going by. I got very used to drawing with loud music. Almost creating a, a, a silent kind of bubble around me. So that's become very much a part of my working practice, you know, which eventually led um, to going to lots of gigs, meeting musicians, which finally led to me running a couple of record labels. In that whole period, it's quite difficult to talk about, and there was a lot of self-doubt, which is what this little chap is all about. And I feel as though my creative ideas have to be protected, they have to be nurtured, so I've got these little shoots of new growth, but they're all, they're all fenced in. The exterior world looks a bit more scary as every year goes by, I think, for a while. Um, we moved to Rutland and the insomnia seems to be worse. But lots of new ideas, lots of new pictures. So through that whole period, I don't know, 10 years or 12 years or so, I made quite a lot of work, but most of it was on commission. Most of it was somebody asked me to do something and I did it. I think here is the beginning of me just going back to the earlier practice of just making pictures as a way to, not quite self-medication, but as a way to kind of cheer myself up and try and communicate with other people. The whole thing began here. I started with a piece of the drawing which probably became year 40. So I started two thirds of the way through the book drawing this caged bird here in a fruit tree and, and the river and this head of the Greek god of sleep. I've tended to draw this in the evenings or in the middle of the night when I'm awake. That idea that I've recorded significant events that I remember in my life is also bound up with that sort of not sleeping too well, half awake, the rest of the world's asleep. It is a wonderful time when, when most of the world around is, is asleep. It's a great time to just think and do and work and be uninterrupted.
So I'm here in Rutland and uh, there seems to be more ideas, more possibilities. I'm more, much more contented in myself. It's not all good though. Still some awkwardnesses about life. River's flowing a lot faster though. I'm getting more conscious of time passing, things that I'd like to do. Gradually through the drawing, the bushes have become saplings, have become young trees, so that you know the experience, the, the confidence. Uh, you know, you know, even like emceeing the Goldmark Gallery, its gigs here, and all those little things that helped I feel me to become more comfortable as me. I'm just working on the 60th of these panels. So what I'm going to draw here at the end of the drawing is a figure of the Greek goddess of memory. So my idea is that the future is sort of unknown and she's pushing through a curtain, pushing through something semi-transparent into the next stage of one's life, in, into the future pushing her way through a curtain and then beyond the rest of my life we don't know yet what happens next. Finishing a picture is often quite hard because it, 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 get, it can get a bit mechanical towards the end. So much is, is determined and fixed. I've drawn so much of the image. Towards the end of an image you're always working with what you've done even if it wasn't quite what you intended, it, it, you've, you've gone, you know, I can change the tone of something, I can change the colouring a little bit, I can shift things a little, but not a lot. So there comes a point where just bite the bullet and put the rest of the work in to get to the completed image. But I don't think I'm disappointed. I think every picture fails me. So there's always a reason to start again, to try again. This foreground bank of the river has uh, represented my interior, my kind of imaginings, my creativity, the things I think about. And strangely enough, that seems to be disappearing. So not quite sure what that means. I have to hope that if I were to continue this drawing and continue drawing my life on into the future, some kind of imaginary life, imaginative, creative, spiritual, philosophical, what, you know, the stuff that goes on in your head, that that would re-emerge and carry on. I'm, but I'm very surprised to have begun something that was quite ambitious in the amount of time it would take to complete. Yeah, to get to the end of it is, is almost surprising in a way. I don't ever remember choosing to make pictures. That's sort of what I think I'm here to do. Freud would say that that's what boys do, you know, they try and collect stamps or coins or marshal their mates into a gang. Yeah, I think a bit of it has got to be deep down that the world's a bit odd and a bit scary and a bit I don't quite understand it. Give me a nice big piece of paper and I'll try and figure out some order for the next five minutes. For, for me, that's, that's the compulsion. That's the reason to do it. I think that might be the last few dots. It's a drawing of the life that I've had 
it's some kind of record from my memory of the life that I've had. But it doesn't feel... doesn't feel like it's any kind of stop. It feels quite exciting that out here, somewhere, there's hopefully more life, more things, more events, more stuff. I mean, I'm not sure I do want to know why I do it. Um, I kind of like doing it, so. I mean, I'm trying to make pictures that stand instead of me. I don't have to talk, the pictures can do it. That's it.